Good afternoon, guys. Uh, thank you very much for coming yet again. Um, today we have Thomas Kipp. He is the owner of Athletes Den, um, and he's here to talk a little bit about um, massage therapy, uh, therapy and the benefits of it. All right, so give him a welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming out and uh, joining me for this. Uh, usually, how I like to run these are very informal, so like, feel free to interrupt and, and ask questions as we go along. Um, it's it's usually a great way for me to gauge if I'm presenting in a way that's that's understandable as well too. So um, I'm not the type like hold all questions to the end. Like to me, that's you'll forget your question by the end. Um, so my goal with today is to to help you guys understand um, what's actually happening with the massage. Because um, uh, the thing I've learned in in the industry is I don't like how a lot of times it's like oh well you're your energy or your chi or that kind of stuff. I like to try to break it down in as much of a scientific approach as, as possible. That way it's understandable and you can relate to it and make sense because if you can, if it can be logical, it's much more understanding and it's less mystical, right? Okay, so, so these are just come, some of the, the main talking points I'll be talking about um, just to kind of build on your understanding of, of once we get to the point of like the massage and the holistic understanding of it. Um, and holistic just means like in its entirety, like the whole body in its entirety. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the skeletal system, the muscular system, the lymphatic, the adhesions, um, what those are, how they can form trigger points, and then the fascia and um, what that all means. All right, so uh, some basic understanding that I want you to have with the skeletal system um, is basically what's really important about the skeletal system is what you have is what's called centration. So basically what centration is, is your ability to properly centrally locate the joint. So um, talking in uh, kind of simple terms like when you have like your, your femur here Socket, the more you can get this femur in the, in the center part of the hip, the, the easier it will be for you to maintain balance across that joint so that it's more efficient with your movements. Um, and we'll kind of we'll kind of bring some of this into with some of the muscular, sure, but I know a decent amount of jobs nowadays are, are desk jobs, so we end up you know sitting like you guys are doing for a long period of time. Um, which then kind of orientates your femur more in the back part of the hip socket, creating a lot more tension in the front of the hip, which then leads to a lot of weakness in, in like your glutes. So then when you try to go to stand up, it's really hard for you to stand up. It feels you know, real creaky, you get some back pain because you end up being so tight here that you don't, you don't go to extend from the hip You because you're not gonna walk around like this. You then walk around with, you know, more of an arch here and that puts a lot of compression here. So a lot of times what we'll end up doing is focusing not necessarily on the back where your primary pain is felt is going to be is trying to release that tension in the front so that we can then orientate that femur a little better in the front of the hip socket so that when you go to stand up it's it's more efficient through the hip and you put less compression on the back. All right, so uh, the musculature. So what I always like to, kind of unclear, but what I always like to talk about when it comes to the muscles is they're, they're set up in a way that I always like to describe it as, as like, it's like an onion where there's many layers through it except for if every layer of that onion went in a different direction. And that's very strategic of the body because what it does is it helps create more stability with our movement pattern. So if you start to move in a way and your ankle starts to roll, you have that many more layers to try to stop and prevent you from going in that motion. Um, now the downfall to that is because of the layering of it, those layers can actually get stuck together and that's where kind of that, that idea of like adhesions, we'll, we'll talk more in depth about comes into play because that's where it kind of gets stuck together and, and it makes some of those movements harder to do, especially if it's a repetitive type of movement that you do on a regular basis. 
So looking at the muscle chart, uh, the, the right side here, this is all of your deeper musculature. So what we would call more of like your stabilizer. So like your, your hip here, a lot of people have heard of like your piriformis, which is this muscle here. And that muscle is uh, claim to fame is, is always known because of its proximity to your sciatic nerve. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people that have desk type jobs might suffer from what we would call like sciatica. Uh, true sciatica is more going to be a compression of that sciatic nerve from the lumbar spine. Uh, whereas uh, piriformis syndrome would be where that nerve comes out of the spine and then it runs right underneath that muscle. So uh, if you can imagine if you have that nerve running right under, underneath that piriformis muscle and it gets tight, it can kind of press on that nerve, recreating a lot of the same symptoms as, as the true sciatica. And, and that's where you know, a, a skilled massage therapist is, is good at differentiating the two um, because the latter is, is much easier to treat. Uh, it's not easy to treat, but easier to treat than, than the spinal um, issue. So, so yeah, you have more of like your stabilizing muscles, which are gonna be what ends up being compromised first when it when we get out of that idea of centration because that once you lack that passive stability of the proper joint location you're going to then seek stability through your active stabilizers which are going to be the muscles uh, and then on the left side of the chart you're going to see more what we call like your primary movers so those are going to be muscles like your glutes your hamstring your your quad your lats, your traps. Um, a lot of people know about your traps because those are the ones that get tight from, again, kind of being in that fixed position all day. Any questions about that so far? Good. All right, so here we have your lymphatic system. So to me, this is one of the most important topics we'll kind of talk about today because it's one of the main benefits of immediate massage and then the kind of style that I've adapted over the years what ends up being more of a lasting effect of, of, the, of the benefit of massage and we'll kind of talk about that. So the the thing to understand about the lymphatic system, unlike your cardiovascular system, your lymphatic system is an open network. So your cardiovascular is closed, meaning that like your, your heart pumps and it pumps blood out and then it opens and it pulls black, blood back in. The lymphatic, you actually need some sort of external stimulus. You need some sort of external pressure in order to get the lymph into, like to get your, your metabolic, what's called your metabolic byproduct into the lymph system. So when I say metabolic byproduct, all that is is like you eat something, it turns it into energy, you use that energy. A lot of people have heard like uh, lactic acid, right, from like you go for a run or whatever and you get sore. That's a buildup of your lactic acid. So as you kind of see here, um, so these kind of, openings here, those are the valves and the, the opening into the into your actual thing. So the, all these little like colored dots, that's your tissue. So you would have like the, the build up kind of all in this like interstitial space here. So that external pressure is going to push in here and allow that tissue into your lip. And it only flows up. So kind of like your veins in your arterial system, if something were to press down on it, you can see how there's this like layering down here on the, the little chart here. So if a pressure came this way, that valve would close, right? So that's where a lot of times when you're doing like, I don't know how, if, how many people here do like any kind of foam roll? Foam rolling? Okay, so foam rolling is, um, is a great way to kind of 
you know, using a nice soft foam roller is a way to stimulate this same kind of result that I'm talking about because it's going to be that external pressure and it will kind of press in. But that's why when you're doing that, that style of foam rolling, you always want to move from your feet towards your head because the lymph moves all the way up and it eventually it doesn't show it here, I don't think, no, but it eventually dumps into what's called your right subclavian vein. There's a huge vein right before it gets to your heart and then your, your heart can kind of process all that, that, that byproduct again. So does that, does that make sense to everybody? Like, why that's important to understand. So, kind of tying that together. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where like, we, we get that like, you can get like swelling in your feet um, and you know, and we'll kind of talk about like why, how that happens, right? So, okay, so you're, so this slide is called adhesions, right? So what you're looking at here is a slice of a muscle tissue. And what you have is you kind of see like this like white fibrous looking stuff around the whole muscle here. That one's called your epimycium. And then as you move down, like that's the whole muscle. And then you have a, like a piece of that muscle and that's coated with another little bit called your paramyceum. And then as you get into like the actual individual fibers, that's where you're gonna have that, that super more thin um, coating. And all that really is, it, that's what, like when you hear the word fascia, that's what they're talking about. So it's this like interconnected web of like, of elastic type of tissue that really what its goal is is it helps with the efficiency of our movement patterns it's it's not free energy but it's much more efficient so next time you pick up you and you can kind of see from this slice here it almost looks like one so next time you go to the grocery store and you buy a steak um, when you look at that like a lot of people make them the, the the incorrect assumption that all that white in it is, is fat. Um, I mean, it, it can be, but most of that is the fascia. And it's this like interconnected web that runs not just throughout the whole muscle, but it actually connects the whole body. So you would have it like, cause this is only one muscle here, right? You would have that muscle on top of another muscle that would be, remember going back to the, the, the onion effect of it, right? So you, you have all this connectedness through all the fascia in, in, in the muscle. Well, what you also have to remember is like those adhesions, what they, what they are is when, uh, they're actually a good thing. Um, it's when they become stagnant and they're not moving properly, that's when they're a bad thing. So adhesions are is a thickening in that tissue to allow for more efficiency because if, if you send your body the same stimulus like all day every day, if you have to like lift boxes for a living, um, you're going to build adhesions to help you be stronger in that movement pattern because your body's like, oh, okay, you know, Johnny's going back to work, we know what we're doing, right? So what ends up happening though is from, from overuse of that area, you can start to stiffen up in there. And, and that's where like the, the stuff with the foam rolling is great because you're gonna actually, say you, you have a hard day at work and you go home and you foam roll, you're gonna help eliminate some of that byproduct, right? So if you don't do that, you get pooling of that, that metabolic byproduct in that area because it's not getting that external stimulus to enter back into your limb. Right? Does that make sense? So, um, this what this kind of talks about is is like what's called like a knot. Like it, it's I don't know. I'll, I'll read it. So it says the continuously contracted knot in the muscle fiber stops blood flow at the trigger point, starving tissue of oxygen and nutrients. This is where and the metabolic waste that metabolic byproduct we were talking about 
So metabolic waste and toxins build in the area causing pain, tension, and spasms in the muscle. So that like, that pooling, because you only have so much space in the area, right? So that pooling, it, it presses on the nerves, creates what we call our trigger points. So for me, uh, what a trigger point is, is it's a way to help me figure out where your problem is. Because every session when somebody comes into me, when they're, especially if they're new, I'm trying to get a, a gauge of, of your, what I call your pattern. Because everybody has one. Like, I don't care how healthy you are, like you have what I joke and say, like a top 10 of problem areas going on in the body, right? So the, the trigger points are this like general guideline of, of pain that you might experience and that helps me narrow down where you're having a problem in the muscle. So uh, for example, since we kind of already talked about it, um, the piriformis, so um, that's going to be this one here, this, this um, diagram. Um, I'm also having to explain because there's a YouTube video, so I got to explain a little bit more in depth. So it's going to be a bottom right chart, uh, middle leg, um, the like kind of deeper red referral pattern. So, and the other thing to understand is, so if you notice this one, and it shows it on kind of more like the bones, right? See how it shows you just the bones in this picture? as opposed to like this one, um, looks very similar, right? So it's like in your calf, in your hamstring, kind of up into the hip a little bit. But this one shows you more on the musculature, where this one shows you that deeper pain. So, and that's what a lot of times when they're like, oh, I'm getting this like pain down the back of my leg, kind of here, kind of skips my knee a little bit, and then the calf, I'm like, well, does it feel deep? Or does it feel like more superficial, like more towards the surface, like in the muscle? And that kind of helps me differentiate where, again, where that problem might be occurring. So, uh, so going back to that, so when when you when you experience this like trigger point here, what ends up happening is it creates this very specific pain pattern down down through the leg, and it's actually very very similar to what we talked about the true sciatic because the true sciatica because it is still compressing on that same nerve, but where it's coming from is, is gonna be good. So the thing that I always like to talk to people about during the session is when I'm working on an area, let me know immediately when you experience, if you experience any of the type of pain that you're experiencing you know, in, your, in your day to day, because if I'm on a muscle that has that kind of similar trigger point pattern that you're experiencing, and I hit that and it recreates that pain pattern for you, that is great. Because what that lets me know is, that lets me know that most of your pain is coming from that, that muscle and that trigger point. So and that's where what I, what I would do is I would you know, really slow down whatever stroke I was doing for that, that muscle to help kind of melt down that, that adhesion so then when you go to move that muscle, it's much more efficient and you can, you can eliminate that on your own. Because remember we talked about that external stimulus that's needed for the lymph to be flowing. You actually have that same external stimulus because if you think about it, right, like your muscles are pretty much all over your body and so is your lymph. It's like, you know, it runs all through there. So anytime you contract a muscle, it is that same kind of stimulus, so it gets kind of flowing up. So it sounds like if you're going for massage therapy, you should get really hyper. Yes, so that's a great point because I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard massage therapists tell their clients, make sure you hydrate now. I'm like, no, like, make sure you come hydrated. Like, and I mean, really, we should be drinking a good amount of water every day anyways but yes it's even more important to come to your massage well hydrated because more of that that HO matrix you can have in your lymph the easier it's going to be for you to process all that that byproduct once it gets into your it's a great question so yeah kind of going back to that idea of of that 
that interconnected web and the muscles. So, because that's to me my end goal. So there's a there's a a technique that's called neuromuscular therapy, and what that is is it's a very specific. Hold on, sorry. It's a very specific technique that addresses the pinpoint trigger point, and it's great. I just call it like the good old like thumb in the dam, though, like or finger in the dam. Like it's great. Like you put your finger there, and it, it alleviates the pain right away, and like you might feel good for the rest of the day, and that's fantastic. But what ends up being more important is is addressing your pattern, right? So. Um, say, kind of going back to what we were talking about in the beginning about like you sit for a living, you have this tension in, in here, right? So what ends up being problematic is because of that guarding that ends up occurring in that piriformis or the gluteus minimus in through the back part of the hip. So you feel the pain here, right? Where the problem isn't necessarily in that back, you're, that's more of a byproduct. Like your pain is back there because of the byproduct of you being so tight in the anterior portion of your hip. So to me, if I can work the anterior part of the hip, get that more loose and, and more supple in through the, the anterior aspect so that when you then go to stand up, you get actual better contraction through that musculature in the back side. So then when you then leave my session, you are moving more efficiently through your hip period, not just where that, that trigger point is forming. So then when you go about your day, you're getting your own kind of contraction and compression on that lymphatic system outside of, you know, just while I'm doing it or just while you're doing it on the foam roller. So to me, that's, that's kind of the most important part of, of understanding massage therapy and, and the whole lymphatic system and the trigger points is that that connectedness of how it relates to itself and, and not necessarily like just what I would call like you're not just chasing pain. Um, you want to address more of the root causation of it so that eventually you don't have that same pattern. And it, you know, it's pretty normal to kind of fluctuate all through your, like what I said, like that top 10 pattern of, of movement and, and tightness because again, we, we kind of have all that. Can you address the situation of a charming horse and how to stop it from happening? Or sure, absolutely. Okay, so um, she asked like how, how to address uh, a Charlie horse. Um, so uh, basically I, that, I would call that more, it's a cramp, right? Um, so there's, there's always, there's two theories with, with cramping. Um, a lot of practitioners talk about like the electrolyte imbalance of the area. To me, that's not usually what's going on in that because if that were the case, if it were more of an electrolyte imbalance, it would be what we call more systemic. So it would be more widespread. Like you'd be having it like not just in one, one cap, you'd have it like in your hamstrings or your quad, like the whole lower extremity. Um, and that's, so like that localized cramping is kind of a, a result of what we were talking about that like uh, that stagnant byproduct and it, it, there's only so much space so it, it overstimulates that nervous system. So to me, a, a cramp in that kind of scenario is more of a result of like what we call like neural fatigue. So the, the nerve just isn't quite getting it, the, the proper kind of um, relaxation because it's in a constant state of activity, right? So um, that brings in a, like, it's actually my favorite term. So it's reciprocal inhibition. So if you break that down, reciprocal inhibition, so it reciprocates the in, like inhibiting factor. So Go back up to the musculature. Okay, so looking at this and that 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 idea. So when you look at 
Because most people, when they have that happen, they'll feel it in like their the bottom of their foot or in the calf, right? So the the best thing to do in that immediate phase of the of the Charlie horse is to try to engage what we call like the antagonist. So your calf, um, what it does is it points your foot, right? So your soleus and your gastroc both point your foot. So if you can engage the antagonist, so the muscles that oppose that movement pattern, so that's gonna be more of the muscles that bring your toes towards your shin. It's gonna be hard because your body's like, like it's, you know, and it's cramping really hard. So don't try to get like, like full range first, like just kind of pulse it, like just slight movements up towards the shin. And that will, what that does is what the reciprocal inhibition is, is it's when you engage one muscle group, the brain then sends signals to the other group, the antagonist group, to tell it to relax. So the way I always best describe this is like, when I fire my bicep, my brain is sending signals to my tricep to allow it to extend and vice versa. When I, when I extend my elbow, my tricep is contracting, my brain has to tell my bicep to relax to an, an, like to allow that movement to occur. So if, if you're cramping in the, in the calf, engaging those, those antagonists in the muscles that bring your toes towards your shin will help kind of send signals to that, that backside. Does that make sense? A lot of people. A lot of people have that. Um, right? How many like how many people would say they have like irregular Charlie horses? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. That's like forty percent. Um, so yeah, that's where you know uh, doing like learning some simple foam rolling techniques to kind of help flush that area out so there's not as much compression on the nervous system and, and just getting good movement through through the calf and that's why everybody always talks about like going for you know your 10,000 steps a day um, and getting movement through the calves because going back to again like when you contract that calf muscle and that soleus your soleus is actually like your biggest proponent of the limp because it's the biggest muscle in the calf where I mean it, it's complex right so ways the, the best way that I can talk to people about you know preventing problems is staying on top of it and some of it, it it boils down to knowing what to do right like so I talked about like you having a pattern right so to me the the most important thing somebody can do is to learn their pattern and and once you learn that pattern, learning what I, I, I love the analogy of, of like your tool shed, right? So like if you need to mow your grass, you're not gonna go out and get your hedge trimmers and mow your grass with your hedge trimmers. That's super inefficient. You're gonna go in your tool shed, you're gonna get your tool that you need for that specific task at hand. So what I mean by that is like learning like say I have that problem again in that like hip flexor from sitting too much. When I noticed that day, like huh, when I you know went to go stand up, like you know I got that pain in, in the back again. Okay, what did Thomas teach me for that? Okay, and then later that day, as soon as you can, apply that tool so that it doesn't build up. Because if you don't address it as it comes up, it just Right, it just builds and builds and builds, and then next thing you know, you're, I don't even want to mention it, like blowing discs or whatever. But, yeah, so learning your pattern uh, and how to address that is, you know, I mean, that's why we have physical therapists and personal trainers and massage and acupuncture and, and chiropractors, because um, that's what we love to do. We love to teach you guys how to take care of yourselves, because... I, I, I love to joke and like I have two little girls at home so I already have two dependents like I don't need a bunch of dependents like you know like, fix me Thomas so 
um, I, I love to employ you guys with the, the right tools necessary so that you can address it on your own. Two questions. Sure. First is, you know, why does it matter if you stretch before you just it? Okay, or so. Does, or does it matter? It does matter. Um, so, and it, it matters what kind of stretching you're doing. So, um, so there's, there's what's called like dynamic stretching and static stretching. So your dynamic stretching is just, that's just a fancy way of saying like a warm up. So what the point of that is, is to get that joint structure moving and ready for whatever your exercise is going to be for that day. So getting that joint nice and loosened and getting the, and, and stabilized as well. And then the musculature nice and warmed up, getting like your heart rate up. So when your heart rate goes up, you get more blood to the area. So then your, your nutrient exchange is happening. Um, and then it actually like helps warm up that muscle tissue and warms up that fascia so that when you then go to like, go to squat or run or like, it's nice and, and looser because of that warmth because the fascia responds to, to heat. So the more you can get that warmed up, you're less likely to, to tear something, right? Um, as opposed to more of the, the static stretching, um, and my thought process on the static is, is a little different than a lot of people's. I don't like to show what we call like passive static stretching, where like, um, like the one I saw the most in, in the PT world is you're laying like to stretch your hamstrings. You lay on your back, put, your, put a rope around your foot, and you just lift that rope up and hold that hamstring stretch for 30 seconds to a minute. Um, to me, that's not effective because the more you can incorporate the brain into the activity, the more you're gonna build better connections and, and teach it like, okay, like this is what we wanna do. We want to extend. And the more active you can get it, like I've, I've actually never seen somebody do that hamstring stretch, hold it for 30 seconds and actually elongate the muscle. Um, if you go into that, that position, and, and gently resist that and contract the hamstring, and then it'll actually ease up a little bit as you go. Um, so, so that, does, that, does that answer your question? Like, why those were important? Second question? Well, the second question, in, in its simplest terms, is who do you go to? <laughs> so, um, but, but the bigger question is how does it matter? So, like, I see a guy that I work with at my facility, um, Steve, um, and to me, there's a couple factors with that. One, uh, like, honestly, the most important is, like, your comfort level. Like, you, you want to be able to be comfortable with that person, because if you go and you see somebody and you're, you're tense and you're just, like, like nervous all the time, there's no real benefit that's going to be gained. Um, so having a good kind of like personality match is kind of important. Um, but outside of that, like pretty much most massage therapists in this town went through the Florida School of Massage. Um, so we all experience the same training, but it's it's interesting that the, the best way I can describe it is like we all we all know how to dance, right? Some people dance better than other people. Some have, you know, they get drawn to salsa as opposed to like hip hop. So, I mean, I have a book at home that's like this thick with hundreds and hundreds of styles of massage therapy. And the therapist just kind of gravitates to what they like. Um, or, you know, not necessarily what they like, but what they find to be the most beneficial for their clients. Um, so I, I guess what I mean by that is like when you are seeking out a massage therapist, you, you kind of want to know what your goals are from the massage. Um, because if you're just, if you're going for, you know, a relaxation massage, that ain't going to be me. Like nobody comes, and I joke, if, if somebody comes to me for relaxation, I'm like, somebody's pulling your leg because they hate you or, or they're busting your chops because that's not what I do. Like I, I do more of what I'd consider like outside of my sports massage practice, I do more like orthopedic assessment and getting 
again, kind of helping you understand that that pattern. Um, Correct. I wouldn't do more of the exercises aspect of it. I would do more of the, um, I don't know if you remember, so like on the title screen, like I'm a massage therapist and a mobility specialist. So I've studied a lot on like flexibility and how the body moves and like call it like body mechanics and um, like the kinesiology, like the study of movement. So getting people to, to understand that is, that's always my goal. Um, and you know, so, there, there's a plethora of MTs in this town, and um, we all kind of roll a little, we dance a little bit. So. But that's, it is hard because you're experimenting with your body, right? And what what I always try to encourage people is, if you go and have, like, I love you guys are obviously interested, right? Like, if if you go and get a massage and it's a bad massage like that's just a bad massage that doesn't mean massage is not good for you even like if somebody comes to me and I work on them in a certain style and they don't they don't respond in a positive way I love when they come back and they're like it didn't help I'm like okay like let's try something else like I've got a plethora of other techniques that we can try to to address your issue so even you know within that so that's where being open and, and communicating what your expectations are with the massage will help you learn who a good massage therapist is for you. And like I said, unfortunately, you end up having to experiment with your own body. Um, but as long as you communicate to that practitioner, like, hey, I don't like that, or like, hey, that's too hard, or you know, please back off, or, or, or whatever, um, usually no real harm will come from it. As long as you communicate with them and, and tell them like, hey, you know, I'm gonna let you know if the pressure gets too much, you know, please back off. Yes. You know when you're trying to lose weight, can they tell you that the muscle weighs more? Is that true? Yes, it does. Um, it's more dense than than fat tissue is. Um, yeah. There are some massage therapists that, that claim that they can help like get rid of fat. Um, I don't, yeah. yeah, like I said, they claim. Good questions, though. I, I like your questions. Um, How many, how many people here go to somewhat regular massage? What's like the like month, like do you do like bi-weekly, weekly, monthly, quarterly, bi-weekly, every other two, every other week? Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's the beauty of it. If you don't go regularly, the thing I always tell people is like, you haven't gone to a massage in a year, like I'm not gonna tell you like you need to start coming once a week because you've been getting along fairly fine, you know, with once a year or never even. Um, so and learning how to like slowly implement body work and, and learning how to adapt to it is, is kind of important too. Because you don't want to just overdo it right away. In addition to the manipulation you do to help uh, somebody There is actual data that shows that massage stimulates um, additional blood flow to areas of the body. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And uh, why that's a good thing? Yeah. So it, that kind of goes back to the idea of, of the adhesions, right? Because if the adhesion is stuck in an area and you have that, that, that uh, your vascular system flowing through that area, and it's, it's bound in that area, of course it's gonna restrict any blood flow that's trying to go past that restriction. So the more we can melt down that adhesion and get that more supple and less binding on that, it'll help with the flow of that. And, it not, and it's not just the cardiovascular, it's the nervous system and the, the lymphatic system too. Because the more you can get that flossing through there and moving, and moving prettier, it will help with the nutrient exchange down the down the line.
Yes, sir. Say that again? Yes. Uh, he was asking if, if I treat people with carpal tunnel. Um, yes, uh, I have. So what carpal tunnel is, it's a channel in your wrist where, like we talked about, where the, the nerves and your blood flow and your cardiovascular system go through that, that tunnel. And in, in my opinion, what if it's not like a structure, So when you deal with enough tension, because when, when you're dealing with tension in the muscle, like if you have that built up adhesion in that muscle, when you go to try to contract it, it becomes less and less and less efficient. So then you start to try to alter the movement pattern in slight ways. So you start using other muscles around that, right? So, and, and what, what provides the movement, right? The muscle contracts, it pulls on the tendon, the tendon attaches to the bone, and that tension in the muscle is what pulls on the bone. So if you're dealing with, you know, you know, a, a, a situation that's based on chronicity, like for a long time, eventually like that, that pulling on that tendon just starts to alter the, the joint structure and starts to collapse that, that carpal tunnel. And then over time, you can build up enough scar tissue to where like it actually s stays in a way in, in that enclosed position. So to me, what I usually do for that is it, it, it and it depends on how long you've been dealing with it. Like you, I would treat it with, um, you know, some, some very specific techniques right around that channel, but then also up the chain in your, in the forearm to help loosen up that musculature and make it more efficient. So it, when you go to type or, or lift or squeeze, that it, it's easier for you to do that movement. What, what's, what's interesting though is, uh, I'm not saying it's often, but people can actually get misdiagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome and um, what we would call like thoracic outlet syndrome. So your thoracic is your, your trunk here, right? And you have nerves that come out of your, your neck, down into the arm, and then down here. So you can get compression anywhere along that line, and it'll recreate that same, that same kind of pain pattern in the hand. So like, as you see in the like, this top right chart, right? When it comes to like hitting a muscle and it recreates that pain pattern for you, awesome. Because that lets me know that some of that like pain or feeling that you're getting might be more orientated around the, the muscle than the actual like joint compression. So a lot of times I don't just, when I, when I treat that, I don't just treat that because it might not be that at all. Um, you know, I would treat that whole entire, what we call like the line. So like, from like, the grass is fine, out into the shoulder and down. Because it, it could be, it could be any of that musculature. And that, that can really be applied to really any problem in, in the body of like, what, you know, the diagnosis. There, there's a lot of, diagnosis that get thrown out by a doctor that I'd call like an umbrella an umbrella diagnosis like telling somebody they have low back pain like you couldn't be more general because that can be coming from so many different problems um, yeah and, and learning the, the very very specific parts of your your pain or dysfunction is is what you know what's really important 